Okay, we're going to spend a bit more time talking about uh, different kinds of queries and talking about different kinds of relationships between tables and so on. That should definitely take us through today and uh, probably some, some of Tuesday next week uh, before we're ready to hop on to the next topic. Um, very often, our queries are not to show literally everything in a database, right? Um, because, you know, when we're talking databases, we're talking about, you know, thousands, possibly millions of rows in the database. I mean, how many products are there in Amazon's database? Literally millions, right? So uh, it would be very rare to write a query that would want to show all of those, all right? Uh, we'd want to narrow it down at least by some mechanism, by a search term, by a category, and so, and so on. So there are times when you have a small table, like maybe all the departments at the college, that you'd want to show a query that showed all the departments. All right, that would be reasonable because in a college there's probably, you know, eight or ten different divisions, right, at, if that. Whereas to show all faculty, yeah, you might want to do that, but you'd probably want um, the ability to choose a particular faculty person. All right, so let's talk about creating a... Uh, a query that accepts um, a faculty person, all right? So, if we were to write a query to uh, show every faculty person and their division, it would look like this. This is what we had last time. Select First name, last name, department name. Forgive me if the columns are a little bit off, but you get, I think you get the idea. From faculty division where faculty division ID equals division, division ID. We said this is a case where you have two tables that have a relationship. Even if they have a foreign key defined, you still have to explicitly say in the SQL statement how to match them up. All right? So we will match them up this way, by matching up the division ID in one table with the division ID in the other table. Um, what could go wrong with this? All right. In fact, I'm going to pull up the example. Instead of writing it on the board, I'm going to go and pull up the example. And we'll look at, we'll look at, uh, we'll look at uh, the thing that way. Let's pull over our example from last time. What's today? Ten five? Ten four.
here, file open, website, it's a college site, and if you remember last time we had a, um, I made a, a query like last Thursday, and then I made a query on Tuesday that duplicated it. We're going to start off by looking at one of those, because we're going to change one of those. So let's look at faculty list two. Also, as I'm doing this, because the query might be a little hard to read, I'll bring the query into Notepad++. Here's our SQL data source. And remember, we're always going to have two things to our database interaction on a web page. We're going to have the data that's used to populate stuff, and we're going to have the way we're going to visually represent it. We may pull data from a database and show it in a drop-down. We may pull data from a database and show it in a table. We might show a form, one field, one row at a time. We can show data from a database query a whole bunch of different ways. All right? And therefore, this gives us the flexibility to take the same data and show it different ways on a page or whatever. So the two are sort of separated. And as you know from your experience in software development, where you can take things and sort of separate them into their own components, that's usually a very good strategy. So we look in here and we have this query that looks like this. Don't tell me my car battery was also powering this computer. Whenever this happens, I hear, like, Scotty from Star Trek. Sorry, Captain, I just can't do it much longer. <laughs> yep. Well, there we go. There we go. And the Klingons won. All right, let's try this again. Take two. By the way, we should be able to find our query in here, right? It's part of the data source object. There's a connection string. There's a provider name, which tells it what kind of data source it is. And there's our select statement. Remember, our the visual interface, the GUI interface, is just a tool to write this code for you, right? It's nothing, nothing magical about that. So you can look at the code, and in sometimes, in some instances, looking at the code is easier and is a more direct way of seeing what's going on in your statement rather than going through the GUI, right? Because the whole purpose of a GUI is to sort of shield you from some details, right? And when you look at the code, you're getting everything that you need. But, again, we'll go through the GUI here and we look at the SQL data source. Don't tell me it's going to do the exact same thing. What a day. Yeah, really. 
You know, I had, when my car wouldn't start, I had two choices. <laughs> One was to say, who do I know that could maybe give me a ride? All right? And the other one was to say, this is a sign that I should just go back to bed. Right? And I'm starting to think I made the wrong choice. We'll try it one more time, and then we'll go to plan B. Right. And uh, after I restarted it, worked fine. I don't know why. This might be a time for us to look at the code view, right? That's plan B for now. Because the GUI mode is dying on me, so I'm just going to look at the... The thing is, it's like... That's weird. It wasn't even like it was using a lot of time. SQL statement looks like this. And I'm going to copy. Actually, I want the faculty department. SQL statement looks like this. I'm going to copy it and go to Notepad++ and we're going to view it. Okay, the SQL statement looks like this. Select first name, last name, full name from division faculty, where faculty division ID equals division division ID. Remember with the where clause, the way SQL statements work is if you don't specify a where clause, a where clause limits the query or the other operation to only a certain set of rows. All right? Now, what happens if we omit the WHERE clause altogether? All right. I'm going to go here and omit the WHERE clause altogether. All right. is this. We get 
everyone duplicated. Everyone shows up twice. Can anyone explain what's going on here? All I did was I got rid of the where clause. The where clause said where faculty division ID equals division ID. I got rid of that. And all of a sudden it shows everyone twice. Why is that? Okay. Uh, not exactly. Yes. Is it pulling both from the faculty and division tables? Like, like, like both their information? Yeah, you're, you're getting warmer. There's no relation? We haven't, de we haven't defined a relation. We haven't defined how the faculty and the division are related. So what does it do effectively? It matches up. Well, let me put this differently. There's two of them. There's two faculty members. Each faculty member is shown twice. All right. How many divisions are there in our database? There's two. All right. Do you think it's a coincidence that every division, every faculty member is shown twice when there are two divisions? Is that a coincidence? All right, let's, let's check. So right now, we have this. Every person shows up twice, and notice they show once for each division. Let's say I go in and add another division. So we've added a third division. And now I hit refresh. Notice everyone shows up three times now. So no, it's not a coincidence that with no where clause, there's going to be, a person's going to show one time for every division that there is. That's what's called a cross product in database terms. A cross product is where you match rows in one table all the rows in one table with all the rows in another table. So this is a hint. All right? If you ever write a query and you get more data or you get duplicated data and it doesn't really make sense, you probably forgot the join or part of the join. All right? So that's a good troubleshooting technique. If, for example, you do a query and every book you see listed twice, all right, you probably forgot the join somehow. Without the where clause, SQL assumes everything. So if I have two tables, it assumes everything from table A matches up with everything in table B. All right. So that's why we get a cross product, and that's why we get the pro uh, the the uh, the uh, professors showing once for every category. So what we can do is we can limit that. So if I put the where clause back in, what I'm saying is. Whoops. I only want to show rows where the faculty division ID equals a division division ID. That limits the output. So now it's not showing every division for every faculty. It only shows a division when the faculty matches that division. So it's not going to show John Adams is being in engineering, business, and information technology. John Adams being in math and science. It's only going to show John Ma Adams in arts and humanity. It's only going to show Harms, Huber, and Zellers as being in engineering, business, and info technology. Because that's when our division ID matches a division ID in the table. So if I go and fix that then, and undo that, now when I run it, I only get the right number of professors. So remember that. The where clause is used to limit people. All right? Now, let's say 
I wanted to get only faculty for a specific department. All right. So let's look back at our database. If I only wanted engineering, business, and IT, how would I change the SQL statement? Well, again, the tip that, that we have is that to limit the output is probably going to be the WHERE clause. So what would we say if I only wanted that one division? Division equals. Exactly. Division equals whatever the value is. So in this case, I can say and division dot division ID equals one. And that will give me everyone that's in engineering, business, and IT. And I can test that out, right? I can make a query in access and check it out. So if I put that query in, blah, 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 and division ID equals one, when I run it, I only get the three people who are in engineering, all right? What if I want the people in the Arts and Humanities division? Well, I change that one to two, because that's the ID of Arts and Humanities. Whoops, I didn't want to do that. I was thinking along the lines of the name when you said engineering. Or you or like a wild card. You like could this. do that. We're going to do it this way first, and it's then we're going to. Easier, yeah, it's a lot easier this way. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to do another example the way that you described it. Okay, so I'm going to go back to this query, go to SQL view, change that to division ID equals two, and then we just see the person there. So the bottom line is, if we want to pull up people from just a division, we're going to have the WHERE clause to match the, the, the two tables together. We need that, right? We're also going to need a WHERE clause to limit the division. And this could be done a couple different ways, all right? Probably the easiest and the best way to do it will be to do it based on the division ID, all right? Because that's the primary key. So, if I want a division of 1, I put a 1 in here. If I want a division of 2, I put a 2 in here. I could replace this with a blank. And I could make this pull up any division that I wanted to, as long as when I ran it, I gave a value for that blank. Right? That's what's known as a parameterized query. So, in... ASP.NET, that blank is designated by a question mark. So I'm going to say where division ID equals question mark. And then I'm going to fill in the specific value of what division I want when I run the code. All right. So I'm going to ask the user, what division do you want? Do I want division 1, division 2, division 3, division 4? All right. Everyone with me so far? All right. Now, how am I going to ask the user what division they want? If I gave them simply a text box to enter a number in, would that be a good idea? No. Why would that not be a good idea? There's too many numbers. There's too many numbers, and who knows what division one is and division two. People don't know divisions by their internal number. Remember, this is just an auto number. It exists within the database, but no one in the outside world refers to it. All right? It would be like if you want to do a search by a uh, professor. You don't know what my professor ID is, so you'd search by name. All right? Fortunately, with departments, what we can do is we can create a drop-down where we show the user the name of the department 
And behind the scenes is the value of that. All right? You're following what I'm saying? We have the name that we display so that the user can pick it out. And then we have the ID, which is what the query is going to use. Because we need to put an ID in this field, right? We need to put a one, two, three, four, whatever. But most users aren't going to know that information. Most users are going to know it by name. So a dropdown is a neat little tool where we can display something that the user understands, but behind the scenes we have the actual value of the key from the database. So that's what we're going to do. All right. So let me go in here. Hope that this works. And I'm going to... View this in design view. And I'm going to add to this page a drop down list. All right. Now, remember in the past, like a couple weeks ago, how we made a drop down list? I went into edit items. And I put in the values of the things. Would that be a good idea now? No. Why not? Because you actually have a data source. Yeah, you actually have the data in the database. Why should I manually go things in and maybe do it inconsistently? Maybe if I put the values in this way, I'd forget a division. Or what happens if they added a division? All right? I'd have to remember to go back and change this code. All right? So... I don't want to manually enter that in here. I want to pull the data from the database. So again, this is another case of where we're going to use a query to pull data from a database and use it to populate something visual on our page. So, I'm going to go here and I'm going to drag over there a SQL data source. Well, that's a spoiler. I was going to ask you, would I use the same SQL data source or would I use a different data source? And the answer is I would use a different data source. Sometimes that's confusing for students, whether you use the same data source or a different data source. The way I say it is I would describe in words what the data looks like. And if it sound, the description sounds the same, then it's the same data source. If the description sounds different, then it's a different data source. This drop-down, I simply want to be a list of all the departments. This, I want to show a list of faculty people and the department that they belong to. Do those two things sound the same? No. So it's a different data source. One is a list of faculty members. One's a list of departments. So they're different. So I'm going to pull a new SQL data source on this page. I'm going to configure it. What is my connection string? Well, the connection string I've been using all along. Yay! You made it past it. What do I want to see? I want to pull from the division table. I'm going to use the little query builder here, just because we haven't done it yet. I'm going to show the division and the full name. All right. And I'm going to want to order by the full name. Because right, I probably want these in alphabetical order. The numbers, remember, are meaningless to users. They don't know what division 1 is. They don't know what division 5 is. All right? But they should be able to read and understand the names. All right? can click Next. I can test my query. That looks good. I can finish. So now I have that data source. That data source contains a list of... Now I have to marry or bind that data source with the drop-down. And this is difficult. There we go. I'll click on the data source and I'll say, or I click on the drop-down and I say, choose data source. Well, my data source is SQL data source 2. This is where it helps to give meaningful names. I should have called SQL data source 1's 
SQL data source faculty list and this SQL data source department. All right. So I should have gave it a meaningful name. But I know that it's the second one I created, so it's SQL data list, data source two. Now it's asking me how I want to populate the dropdown. What do I want to display in the dropdown list? Do I want to display the division ID? No, because the whole reason that we said we did this is that users don't know the division IDs. We want to display the name of the division. What field do we want for the value of the drop-down list? That is the ID. So we're going to show the division name, but behind the scenes we're going to have the ID. Because that's what that query is going to need to do its job. Is it's going to need the ID number of the division. Now, I go and I say OK. Let's run this now. All right. I run this. There's my drop down. But it doesn't do anything. All right. Well, at least we got the drop down to work. So the drop down worked, but the drop down isn't tied to the query yet. All right. And this is where I'm getting nervous, because this is where every time I've done this so far, the machine has crashed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this onto a thumb drive uh, so I don't have to redo this stuff, try rebooting the machine, and try it again. Okay, so let me do that now. I think deep freeze has been great for our college, you know, to put the machine so that they reset every time they reboot. That's gotten rid of so many viruses and malware and all that. The problem is, is as a teacher, it gets to be a real pain, all right, because I have to install things every time. So I'll go here and I'll copy this to my thumb drive. Are there actually little people writing the data to the thumb drive? <laughs>
27 bytes per second it was that round. 24 bytes per second. Zero bytes. immediately I'm going to try one more time to get in and if this doesn't work I'll reboot let's remind ourselves what we've seen so far I've made a drop down with the with the uh, with the list of departments. But they had no effect on the second query because I haven't linked those two together. All right, so, okay, sure, I have a list of departments, but my query still said, give me everyone from every department. All right, so that's why it had no impact. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to put a parameter on that query and tell it to fill in the parameter from that drop down. So, go into faculty department. <clears throat> Configure my data source. say where, well I already have my where clause so I don't have to say where again, but I'm going to say and division dot division ID equals question mark. What the question mark means is I know I'm going to put something in that division ID field. But I'm going to leave the specific value to runtime. So the question mark's like a placeholder. So give this to me when there is a certain value in the division ID. And oh yeah, I'll give you that value later. I hit next. Now is where we specify where that's going to come from. All right. Where does the value of the division ID that I want come from? How am I going to indicate what division ID I want? Drop from the drop down. So I'm going to say the parameter is going to come from one of the controls on the page. There are other cho choices there as well. Like it could from, come from the query string. All right. Could come from a cookie. Could from any number of places. But in our case, it's going to come from one of the controls on the page. Which control? The drop down list. All right. I hit next. I test the query. I put in a value. I have to manually put that in for now because there is no drop down list in this part of the uh, the testing. And there we go. Yeah, that looks like it worked. If I put in division ID of one, then it brought up people from engineering. So I hit finish. I'm going to answer no to that because the data really stayed the same. I'm going to do one more thing, and I'll show you what happens if I forget to do this. I'm going to say this dropdown is auto post back. What auto post back means is every time I change the value in the dropdown, it's going to send the data to the server to be processed. Remember, this database querying goes on on the server side. All right. So therefore, if I make a change to the division I want, 
it won't necessarily immediately reflect on the page. It will reflect on the page when it gets sent back to the server for processing. By changing that and setting it to auto post back, what that means is every time the value of the dropdown changes, I go and I hit the server. So now when I go and do this, everything should work the way that I want. Here's my drop down that contains arts and humanities and notice it shows only that one person. I go and change it to engineering, business and information uh, technology and it shows those three. I pick math and science and it doesn't show anyone because there's no one in our math and science division at the moment. I go back to arts and humanities and it shows that one person and so on. So what I've done is I've successfully defined a parameter in that query. In other words, I'm not going to write a separate query for show me all the faculty of arts and humanities, then a different query to show me all the faculty for engineering, then a different query, query for show me all the uh, uh, faculty in math and sciences. Um, instead, I'm going to write a query that accepts a parameter. All right? that I can use for whatever division I want. I just have to supply the query with the division ID. And in this case, I'm supplying that query from a, um, with, with the division ID, with the parameter, from the value of the dropdown. Questions about this? All right. So, what happens if I don't make that auto post back? If I turn off auto post back, this is what happens. Show me everyone for arts and humanities. So far, so good. But if I change it, the change doesn't reflect that. And it's important to understand why the change doesn't reflect that. Remember, the database querying and all that happens in server-side code. Therefore, until the server is called, None of that database stuff works. All right. So therefore, right now, I change a dropdown. Changing a dropdown doesn't automatically cause a call to the server. What causes a call to the server? Well, if I had a submit button. So I could put a button on here and click the button, and then that would send it to the server. The other thing I could do is I could make the dropdown have an auto post back field. So it's sort of your choice of how you want to do it. Either way is okay. You could allow the person to make the selection <coughs> from the drop-down and then have to click a button to actually do the search. That would be useful if you had, say, several fields that you wanted to fill in, right? Maybe you had a field for name and a field for division, all right? Let them enter in all those fields and then go and do the search. So that would be one possibility. Another possibility in this case where we only have the one field is we could make it an auto post back where as soon as they make the change to the drop down it automatically submits it to the server and then it goes and displays. Does that make sense? Any questions? All right. Let's write a different kind of query. All right. A query where we put in the person's name. And in this case, we're going to put in the person's last name. All right? And then we're going to do queries for that. All right? Now, someone alluded to this before, that we could have done something like this with the department number. But in our case, it's probably better to do it with the name, uh, with, with, the, with the department ID. But if I wanted to pull up a specific person, could say where last name equals a parameter. All right? So I could do that. So what, let's go and write, let's go and take our second faculty list and make it do a search based on the name of the person. Now how are we going to enter the name of the person? 
guess we could have a drop down for a list of all the professors, but that seems to be overkill, right? Because there's not just five or six professors, like there's five or six divisions. There could be hundreds of professors. So we probably don't want a giant drop down that shows everyone's information. We we'll just want the person to be able to freeform type in the name. All right? So I'm going to go over to here. And I'm going to save this just because this has me worried how the way things are going today. I could easily see this blowing up. Except I forgot this takes 10 years. started so I better let it finish. going to go and I'm going to change this guy to have a, a search by name. Right now this guy simply shows everyone. All right. So I'm going to put in a text box and a button. I'm going to be smart and change the name of this. Search. Text box search. Does this need to be tied to the database? This text box. We're getting a lot of yes. Actually, this text box does not need to be tied to the database. Because this is just a freeform text box where we can type anything in. The value from this text box needs to be tied to this data source. So if that's what you meant, you're correct. But I don't need a separate data source for it. That's probably how I should have phrased the question. I can see where my question is misleading now. I don't need a separate data source for this because this is not populated from anything from the database. It's simply a freeform text field. We need to take that freeform text field and put it in a parameter here on this one. Okay. Question? Okay. So that's our text box. We have our search button because I don't 
think you have the option of auto post back with text. Even if you do, this will give us a second way of doing it. All right. So now I'm going to go here and I'm going to configure my data source. And I'm going to put a query in here that says where last name equals question mark. So that is a parameter. All right. We don't want everyone. We only want where the last name matches the value that we're going to supply it. When we put the question mark in, we're not saying where we're getting that value from. We're simply saying there's going to be a parameter that this query is going to get that's going to tell it what people we want. All right? Remember, the where limits the query. So when we put a where statement in there, we're not going to get everyone. We're only going to get um, things that match that criteria. So we use the WHERE clause to match up the two tables. We can also use the WHERE clause to filter values from a table. All right. Now, on the very next screen, we have to say where we're getting the data from. Where are we getting the data for that parameter? We're getting it from a form control. Which form control? The text box. All right. Remember what we did before. Well, before we said, well, where are we getting the value for the ID? We're getting it from the drop-down. Here we're getting the value from the text box. Next, I can test it out. Type in Zellers. Works. Type in Zellers. And it works. By default, database stuff is not case sensitive, so you don't have to worry about that. I hit finish. No, I don't need to redo the grid view. And I run this guy. I can type in the name, hit search. And I can see the person. All right. What if I type in Z-E-L-L? -L? It's not going to work. How do you do that? Though? Well, that's the question. How do we do that? We'll take a look at that. Because especially when you have free form text fields, that's something that's very valuable because you might not know exactly how to spell the name. Z E L something, right? You know, some people spell my name Z E L L E R, Z E L L A R. You know, I've seen, for such a simple name, I've seen so many variations of spelling. You can imagine more complicated names, uh, the trouble that people have. So, how do we do that in database terms? Yes? Um, I was just going to ask if like, you use an autocomplete text box. Uh, the autocomplete would help you if you already had data in, if you okay. already entered data in. So it would be good for that. There's some kind of wild card key in there, like a dollar sign? There is a wild card, all right? And what we could do is we can use a different operation. Uh, the other thing we could do, by the way, is Ajax, where we wrote our own sort of autocomplete. Oh, okay. But for this part, what we're going to do is we want to allow for an approximate match, all right? So I want to have it, so if I type in part of the name and it matches, it shows me. All right? So, that's a different operator. That's not the equals operator. It's the like operator. All right? So, I'm not going to say if name is equal to the parameter. I'm going to say if the name is like the parameter. And then, as was mentioned, I have to put the wildcard in. So, I'm going to go back to my SQL data source, configure data source, and I'm going to change it where it says where last name is equal to that, to last name like, 
And instead of question mark, I'm going to say question mark plus an asterisk after. So let me go and pull this into Notepad so we can see it. So here's what the query looks like. Select star from factory war last name like, so like instead of equal, and then I have my parameter plus the wildcard character. So if I type in ZE, will it match Zellers? If I type in RS, will it match Zellers? No. Why not? Because the wild card is only at the end. If I wanted to match it no matter where it appeared, I would do the asterisk before and after. All right. Let's try it like this, and, and maybe that will show a, a better uh, idea of what I mean. So I go here, hit next. The parameter is still coming from the text box. I hit next. I'm going to test it out. I type in ZE. Yeah, the same thing. <clears throat> Percent sign, let's try. Oh, I put a default value of Z. I don't think I wanted that. Test query. Z. Yeah, there it goes. Percent sign, not asterisk. My, my bad. But notice if I type in RS, it doesn't pick it up. Because, again... I said the wildcard is after the parameter, so ZE wildcard. It's going to only match things that start with ZE, not things that have ZE anywhere in it. If I wanted to match anywhere in it, I would do percent sign plus question mark plus percent sign. Okay? So now I can go and run this, and should work. picks up Zellers. If I type in an A, it's only going to show me Adams. It doesn't show me Harms, for example, because Harms, the A, is not at the beginning of it. It's your choice what makes more sense, right? Um, and it's going to be uh, dependent on the situation. For names, I would say I would probably do this, right? I would put the wild card at the end. So, I might not know the whole name, but I probably know, like, the start of the name. At least I might know the first initial, all right? You know, Smith. Is it Smith or is it Smith with a Y or is it Smith that ends in an E or whatever? I don't know that, but I probably know the SM part of it, all right? Um, Zellers, Z-E-L, most people get right, all right? It's after that that they go wrong, <laughs> All right, so I could put in Z-E-L, and with the wild card at the end, it would match most of the typical misspellings that people have of Zellers. Now, in other cases, you might want to put the wild card at the beginning. The title of a book, for example, is the Charles Dickens novel A Tale of Two Cities or simply Tale of Two Cities? I don't know. All right? I think it's A Tale of Two Cities, but it might be simply Tale of Two Cities. So I might just put tail in, and I would have my code look for it anywhere in the string. So it's up to you when you're doing this. Um, course names, for example. If I was doing a search for course names, I probably would put the wild card before and after. Uh, Like this class. This class is Web Database Integration. All right. And if I wanted to pull up every class that had something to do with database, I would want to look for database anywhere in the string. So I'd put the wildcard before or after. So that's up to you to decide what you think works best for the particular problem that you're trying to solve. All right. Questions about this?
All right. Now's, I guess, a good time to stop. There's a couple other things that uh, we can talk about on Tuesday. Um, but I don't think it's worthwhile starting them now with just a couple minutes left. So, um, that's all I had. I will go unlock the lab. I'll come back here to grab my files. And then I will be back in lab.